Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, everybody. Are you ready to worship with us this morning?
situation, even the ones that seem impossible. He can do all things. Declare this with me today. He's the name above the battle. Sing the undefeated. The undefeated Savior stands with me. He's the fighter for the Trinity location, those of you that are worshiping online. My name is Pastor Brad. Welcome to the chapel. Come on. So glad that you guys are here. And 
You know, we're blessed to be able to have a wide reach in our community, but our weekend services wouldn't be possible uh, without the hundreds of volunteers who are giving their time and their talents to create an atmosphere for us to encounter God. And we, we, just, we just love to celebrate our GO team. And not only are they making a difference, but the act of serving is actually making a difference in their lives. And so we have a really cool story for you this morning of someone's life that was changed as a result of serving. Take a look. My name is Richie. Uh, I've been uh, attending uh, the chapel since 2014. And during those times, coming to service, I just, I just didn't feel connected. I just didn't feel that I was uh, serving a purpose. And then in 2017, I committed my life back to Christ. And it was just uh, an amazing feeling. But I still felt like I had more to offer. I, I still felt like God was telling me, I have so much more for you. And when I got baptized in 2018, I was approached and they said, well, what are your next steps? And I said, I don't know what are my next steps. And they told me growth track. And I said, perfect growth track. What's growth track? And that's when I found out what God had in store for me. They told me that growth track would be the place where I could be able to uh, discover my purpose and take the next right steps that I didn't even know I had. So I signed up for growth track and man, what an experience. There was things in me that I didn't even know that I had. There was things and things in me that uh, growth track was showing me the, uh, the gifts that God had for me in my life. I learned how God wired me uniquely required me to be able to make a difference, to be able to help people, make people feel welcome. I've been serving ever since, and I haven't been able to stop. <laughs> so after I finished growth track and I, and I took my spiritual gifts test, I knew that I wanted to be on first impressions. I knew right then and there, that's exactly what I wanted to do. That's exactly where I wanted to be. I love to be able to talk to new people that I've never met before, to be able to welcome them, to be able to let them know that, um, hey, you are loved, you are at the right place. To be able to just pray with them, um, talk with them, laugh with them, uh, and even some, um, some instances, even cry with them. So when people come up to me and say, I don't know what my next steps are, your next steps are growth track, because you're gonna discover your purpose like I discover my purpose. Come on, yeah, put your hands together. That's incredible, right? Incredible story. If you've, if you've met Rich in the lobby, you know that he is exactly where he's supposed to be. And we want to help you find your fit here at the chapel as well. And that's what Growth Track is designed to do, to help you discover your unique design to be able to make a difference in the lives of other people. So Growth Track is two sessions, both either in person or online. Our in-person experience happens the first two weekends of every month. In fact, step one is next week during our service time, so you can hop right in. But if you just can't wait until next week and you wanna get started, you can complete Growth Track online as well. It's very convenient to where you can begin to discover your personality. We're gonna help you unlock those gifts so that you can make a difference in the lives of other people and connect to serving opportunities here at the chapel. And I just love that God is just continuing to build his church through his people. Anybody say amen? Come on, why don't you stand up to your feet? You know, what I love about stories like that is that it reminds me that God is still faithful from generation to generation. He wants to connect our story to his story and what he's doing throughout the earth. And so that we can continue to worship, that we can lift up his name and that we can stand on his faithfulness because he's been faithful from generation to generation. Amen. Come on, let's worship together. We worship, we worship you, Jesus. Welcome, Holy Spirit. I'm calling on the God of Jacob whose love and through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses the one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same 
us sing, oh God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
How we need you. How I need you. Every moment, every second, every hour, Lord. We need you, we need you. We need you, we need you. We need you, we need you. I need you, I need you. Can you just say that? I need you, I need you. Yes, I need you, I need you, Lord. I need you. you know, this is a new song, but it's so true. Every one of us in this room, we represent a different need. Something we came asking of the Lord for this morning. And right now as we sing, oh God, my God, I need you. We're bringing him into every situation. We're welcome in his presence. And we're saying, Lord, there's nothing we can do without you. There's nothing that we can do. There's nowhere we can go. There's nothing that we'll face that with your power we can't overcome. This morning, Lord, I need you. It's a really simple thing to pray, but sometimes it just takes a moment. And I know it's a new song. But if we're honest, I think we all know just where we need the Lord to speak in. We need him to step right in the middle of whatever we came in with today. And for a moment before we move on, I'm going to give you an opportunity to connect that moment to your life. Let it be something that is so much bigger than the words we're saying, but sing from a place of true need and desperation. God, I do need you. All over this room, if you're comfortable, let's lift our hands all over this place. Just welcome him in. It's just a sign saying, Lord, I welcome you in. I need you, Lord. We need you, Lord, with our arms stretched high this morning. We say that we need you. We can't do it without you, Lord. We need your spirit, more of your power. Let's sing, oh God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock of ages. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. We're standing on your faithfulness. Let's sing it again. Oh God. Sing, oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock of ages. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your On your faithfulness, I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty River, come and fill me again. Come and fill me again. One more time, say, come and fill. Say, come and fill me. Thank you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Yes, I am. Oh, God, my God. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock. Church, let me ask you, do you believe? Do you believe what you're saying right now? Do you believe what you're singing right now? Do you believe what you're allowing to rise up in faith in your heart? Do you believe? Do you believe that if he did it for David, that he'll do it for you? Do you believe that he did it for Mary, he'll do it for you? If he did it for Jacob, will he do it for you? If he did it for Moses, will he do it for you? Church, do you believe this morning in a God who does miracles? Come on, let's sing it again. Oh God, oh God, I need you. Come on, let's 
Let's lift it up. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh how I need you now. Oh rock of ages. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh, on your faithfulness. Let's say you free the captives, then we say. Should you free the captives, then you're freeing hearts right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the lepers, then I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same. Oh God, my God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh how I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus. We want you a faithful God. He's worthy. He's more than able. Come on. Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. God is good, amen. Hey, listen, as you're being seated, can you help me welcome everybody watching online and the Hernando Correctional Facility? Come on. Guys, we love you so much. We're so glad to be your family. We're so glad that we're your church. Hey, everybody, welcome to the weekend. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Jason. I'm one of your pastors here at the chapel. For the last five weeks, we've been in this series called Hooked. And it's all about learning how to tackle temptation. You know, because the enemy, he loves to tempt believers and followers. He loves to dangle the bait of whatever is flashy, whatever might catch our notice, whatever we might be starving for. He likes to dangle it in front of us. And if we'll take the bait, what we have to remember is every piece of bait has a hook, doesn't it? And when that hook sets, it rips us out of the life that God has for us. It takes us away from who he called us to be, what he called us to say, what he called us to do. And we've been using this verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, as we learn about tackling temptation. This is what it says. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. Amen? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. How many of you are thankful for a way out this morning? thankful for a way out. This is what our God does. And so listen, there's only three things that the enemy comes to do. He comes to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. That's been his strategy since the beginning. Now, everybody deals with temptation. Everybody here, you, me, Pastor Q, everybody deals with temptation. The details might be different. There might be something that draws you away that might be different than what draws me away. The details might be different, but the strategy is always the same. And we see the enemy strategy in 1 John 2.16. This is what it says. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's one. The lust of the eyes, that's two. And the pride of life, that's three. Comes not from the Father, but from the world. Let's take a look at what these things mean. For the last few weeks, we've been diving into what each of these things mean. So the lust of the flesh, it's a desire to feel I need to feel something. My flesh needs something. I need to be validated. I need to get value from something. I need to feel something. Lust of the eyes. Desire to have. I see it. I want it. I got to have it. What I have seems like not enough, but what they have seems perfect. Jealousy. I want it. Give it to me. Pride of life. The The desire to be first, most, and best. The desire to raise up above everybody else so that you can be in the preeminent position. This has always been the enemy's strategy, even from the beginning in the garden. 
But during this series, we've been learning to become the one that got away. I want to be the one that gets away. How about you? I want to learn how to be the one that gets away. And one of the most incredible strategies that we find as we learn to become the one that gets away is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Let's look at it together. It says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. It says, may you always be what? Half empty, half full, no, filled to the top. No room for emptiness. May you be filled with what? Character. You know that you and I can be full of character, full to the brim of godly character. We were designed that way. Now, I know that this whole series is about fishing, and I have a newsflash for you. I don't fish. Not very good at it. I probably would love it, but I haven't got the chance to do it very much. So I am inept when it comes to understanding fishing. So I had to do some research. Do you know that there are only two types of bites that a fish will, will do? One is reactionary. If you can dangle something flashy, something that catches their attention, they will chomp on it. But more practically, the second kind of bite is really important for you and I today. Fish will bite when they are hungry. When they see a source of food or something that looks like nourishment, something that looks like it tastes good, something that might fill me, they will gravitate towards it every time. You're either reacting or you're hungry. And everything that we're gonna talk about today, every scripture, every principle that we're gonna look at, it's all gonna come down to this one statement and I hope it encourages you and changes your perspective on temptation and it's this, full fish bite less. Full fish, bite less. If I'm not hungry for it, I'm not interested in it. If I am so full of godly character, what do I care about whatever you wave in my face? I'm too full, all full, no room, none. Couldn't possibly think about it. We were designed to be full of character. So we're gonna break down the enemy strategy one piece of it at a time and figure out how do we be full in a world that tries to keep us empty. Let's look at the lust of the flesh, the desire to feel hungry, hungry to feel something. To feel what? Hungry to feel approval, hungry to feel included, hungry to feel accepted, hungry to feel love. looking for worth and value from every other place that we can think of, something that will make us feel like we are enough, feel like we're good, feel like we're worthy or valued. But there is a godly character that keeps us full and it's integrity. When you're dealing with lust of the flesh and you're hungry to feel something, the thing that you can be full of is integrity. Integrity is a mathematical term. It means whole and undivided. Not two pieces, just one. One life, one source, one purpose. That's how we were designed to live. That we would be the same in every situation. I'm not on the platform at the chapel, Jason, and then in the grocery store yelling at a cashier, Jason. Those aren't separate lives. I would like to make them that way. I would like to hide the ugly of my life, wouldn't you? Because of that, we try to keep things real broken up, real segmented. We were never created to live in pieces. But we so often do that because we're trying to find validation, worth and value from all of these other places. But when you live in pieces, you stay broken. God designed us to live one life from one source to accomplish one purpose to move his kingdom forward on earth. And we can be so full of character, so full of integrity, so full of the one life that God called us to live that we actually don't need to find validation from any other piece. You with me this morning? Full of one life so that we're not hungry. Look at what Proverbs 11.3 says. The integrity of the upright guides them but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. Duplicity, more than one.
again, destroyed by having more than one life. Some of us in the room today are exhausted because we're living a double life. We're one thing on the weekend and then we're one thing with our friends. We're one thing at work and then we're another thing at our family. We're one thing with what we post and what we describe to the world is our life and then how we're actually living. Duplicity leads to destruction. We were never designed to live more than one life and keep everything separate, trying to find value from all of these different pieces just to keep us going. Living life in pieces keeps us hungry. Living with integrity, the one life from one source with one purpose keeps us full. One of the best examples of integrity that I've had in my life is our lead pastor, Pastor Q. He is such a man of integrity. I can't even tell you how many ways that he has blessed me and my family and helped me to grow as a leader and as a pastor. I'm so thankful that we get to call him our lead pastor. Amen, aren't you? But one of my greatest examples of this actually is him. In 2013, I started working at the chapel. And one of the first times I got to interact with Pastor Q one-on-one is we went to a baseball game. He loves baseball. It was so much fun. We went to the Trop. We were watching the Rays play. It was amazing. And listen, I'm not going to lie. Pastor Q was intimidating to me. Okay? I really respect him and what he does. His, the gift that God has given and that he uses to move the kingdom forward is incredible. I was a little intimidated. So I thought, all right, I've got to come strong. I've got to not be a mamby-pamby wimp. I've got I to gotta be ready for these conversations because he's a heavy hitter. So I sat down, he and I, with our 15 hot dogs. And I sat down and I said, hey, Pastor Q, what do you want to talk about today? You want to talk about baseball? You want to talk about church? You want to talk shop, about ministry? You want to talk batting percentage? What do you want to talk about today? The look that he gave me, I can't describe to you. It was loving, but it was concerned and it was confused. And he looked at me and he's like, what are you talking about? And in the way that only he can, he tapped me on the knee and said, Jason, listen, I'm not baseball Mark Q and pastor Mark Q. I'm not one thing in one place and another thing in another place. I am God's creation, Mark Q. I have one life, not two. And it blew my mind. I don't think I said another word the whole game. (laughs) Which is fine because he goes to baseball games to relax. And so I think he was fine with it. But I was just astounded. And what it revealed about me is I was trying to keep things segmented in multiple lives. Work was different than home. Home was different than ministry. Ministry was different than how I would go in and interact with my community. Everything was different. I was living different masks for different people, trying to find value in different places. And just with a gentle tap of the knee, hey, I'm not one thing at church and one thing at at home with Trish. No, no, no. I am just his creation. And it totally changed my perspective of what living a life of integrity is supposed to be. I want to show you a depiction of kind of how my life looked. I want you to take a look at the circle here on the left. I was living in pieces. I had a family piece. I had a church and Jesus piece. I had a work piece. I had a friends piece, extended friends, social media. I had all these different pieces. And I spent time bouncing around from one to the other, trying to find value and worth and validation. I was living in pieces and it was keeping me broken because I was hungry to feel. I was taking the bait because I was so empty inside. A lot of us try to live in this one piece, this church and Jesus piece. We try to keep Jesus separated to Sunday or the weekend. And then we try to throw Jesus at all the other pieces. (laughs) We get this wisdom and holiness and, and strength and purpose and vision on the weekend, but we don't take it with us. We just throw it at the other stuff. We'll post a verse on social media. We'll say, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. Wife, have a good day. We'll try to apply holiness. Church, I got news for you. You cannot apply holiness. Holiness has to be integrated into who you are. 
You cannot just throw wisdom at something else. It has to be integrated in who you are. You can't throw strength or vision or purpose at the other pieces of your life. He has to do it in you. And you have to be so connected to the source that every other piece is affected by the source because Jesus is at the center. That's how we were designed. That's how we were created to live with Jesus as our source, to live one life from one source with one purpose with Christ at the center, to be so full of Christ at the center that I'm not looking to get filled from any other thing. All full. See, I'm not a dad or a husband or a pastor or a leader who's also trying to be another piece that is a believer and follower. No, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be a believer and follower first and have a deep and intimate relationship with God where we're drinking from the water of the one source. We're being molded and shaped every day by his goodness so that as I change, everything I interact with around me changes. It changes because I change because I'm connected to the source, amen? That's how we were created to be full so that when all these other pieces of bait start dropping in the water, we're just swimming. Oh, that's cute. Oh, no. Because we're too full. We can spend our life living for satisfaction or living from satisfaction. We can live our life chasing identity and purpose in all these other places or just find it in the one we were created to find it from. If you're hungry to feel good, stop looking at all of these other pieces to make you feel good and just spend time with the one who is good. So full of the one source that I'm just not hungry. Because this is the strategy, right? Remember, full fish bite what? Full fish. Oh, come on now, church. Full fish. Thank you. I'm stuffed. Too full. I'm not tempted to feel, I'm full. Integrity is what keeps us full to combat the lust of the flesh. Let's talk about the lust of the eyes. I see it, I want it, I gotta have it. It looks good, it looks better than what I got, so give it to me now. I see their likes and their hearts and their followers. I want that. I see their calling or their gifting or their wiring. Man, I wish I was that way. I see their life or their hot husband or their good looking wife or their kids who don't drive you crazy. I want that. (laughs) Lust of the eyes, hungry to have. But there is a godly character that keeps us full and it's gratitude. To be grateful. We waste so much time chasing after things that will never fill us. In fact, we spend so much of our time, all of our time chasing that we don't spend any time enjoying. You work 80 hours a week to get the boat that you won't drive because you want a yacht. Love it. But being grateful means I can enjoy what God gave me and I actually take care of it. Gratitude changes things. There is a path to gratitude. Because when you choose to be grateful, it forces you to recognize where your stuff comes from. Who does it come from? God. When you realize that everything that you need comes from God, you stop trying to worrying about meeting your own needs. I don't need to add all these things unto myself because Jesus will add unto me all of these things according to his riches and glory as I seek first his kingdom. That's the truth of God's word. You know that Jesus was grateful? There are about seven times in scripture where Jesus says thank you or he's grateful to his father for something. And there's a couple that I want to talk to you about. The first one is this, when Jesus feeds the 4,000. 4,000 people listening to him teach, desperately hungry. This is where we find ourselves. Then he took the seven loaves. How many loaves? 
Real quick poll of any moms or dads that make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for their kids during the week. Is seven loaves enough to to feed 4,000? No. In case you were confused, not enough. Not enough to get the job done. Was it enough? No. But was it what he had? Yes. And what did he do with it? And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples and they in turn to the people. The next time we see Jesus being grateful, it's when he feeds the 5,000. Similar situation, but a little bit different. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking five loaves and the two fish. Okay, so now I don't need peanut butter and jelly expertise. I actually need some seafood expertise. So if you're good at cooking seafood, I need you to answer this question. Five loaves, two fish. Is that enough for 5,000 people? No. Of course not. Not enough. Not enough to get the job done. But was it what he had? Yes. Yeah. So what did he do? He gave thanks and he broke the loaves. A third time where Jesus gave thanks is when he raised Lazarus from the dead. They took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Did he thank him for raising Lazarus? No, it hadn't happened yet. Did he thank him for giving him joy? No, there was was sadness all around him. He had women weeping, wailers of the family causing a, a ruckus in the community. They rolled away the stone. Lazarus stunk badly, the scripture says. They didn't have what they wanted. So Jesus thanked God for what he did have. I thank you for the truth that you have heard me. All three of those situations include people who wanted something that they did not have. But Jesus was so full of gratitude for his father that he wasn't bothered by what was missing. He just thanked God for what he had. And when we are grateful for what we have, what we have becomes enough. When you are grateful for what God has blessed you with already, guess what? It becomes enough. Yes, God is a God of miracles. And yes, he can supply more. And yes, he can make seven loaves feed 4,000. He can make five loaves and two fish, feed 5,000. He can raise the dead. We serve a God of miracles, don't we? He can do it. When you're grateful for what we have, what we have becomes enough. And sometimes it's not always about spiritual multiplication. And sometimes it's not just about the miracle. Sometimes it's just about your heart changing. Because maybe your wife's not enough. But I bet if you began to thank God for the fact that he gave her to you, she would become enough. So what do you already have? We spend so much time listing out what we don't have and what we want, lust of the eyes, hungry to want, hungry to have. So maybe your marriage is on the rocks, but what is good in your marriage? Find it, because it's there. It might seem desperate, it might seem over, but it's not. Until God says it's over. What about your finances? This is not just some promise that all of a sudden you're going to have a miraculous million dollars in your bank account and you'll be fine. That's not the gospel. What I am saying that God will provide what you need in any way he sees fit. Which means he might do a supernatural multiplication or he might just change you. So that what you see is enough. When we thank him, when we're grateful for what we have, what we have becomes enough. Imagine being so full of what you already have that when the enemy tries to dangle a little bit of bait that said, ooh, this could be more. This could be more. This could be better. This could be better than where you're at right now. Look over there. Look at Jenny. She goes to yoga every day. You could have her. But I'm so full of what I already have. No, I thank you for Jenny, God, but that's not for me. I, I'm, I'm content. I'm satisfied with what you've given me. Imagine living a life so full of gratitude that the enemy didn't have a hope or a chance to distract you or rip you out of the life that he's called you to. Just too full. No room. We're all big fans of Thanksgiving, yes? Me too. But there is... A 10-minute window after the very first feeding where if you show me a kernel of corn, I will smack you. (laughs) 
because I'm too full. I don't have room. I couldn't possibly. That's the kind of life we can live in Christ filled with godly character, filled with integrity, filled with gratitude for what I already have so that I'm not pulled away, distracted, hooked by anything that the enemy wants to put in front of my eyes. Because remember, full fish, oh boy. Jesus, give me strength. <clears throat> full fish. <laughs> full fish, bite less. What about the pride of life? Hungry to be first, best, most. Hungry to be important. Hungry to be celebrated. Hungry to be right. There's a lot of elbowing going on right now. <laughs> but there is a godly character that can keep us full where we don't need the pride of life to be an issue. The godly character that keeps us full for the pride of life is humility. Whose kingdom are you building in your life? Yours or his? Whose strength are you building it in? Yours or his? The question is, what are you full of? Again, there's a lot of elbowing going on right now. I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that could tell me what your spouse is full of, but simmer down. Am I seeking my glory or his? See, humility isn't denying your strengths, but being honest about your weaknesses. God loves that you're strong, but you're not meant to be strong apart from him. You're supposed to be dependent upon the Lord. One of the ways that I practice humility is I have to get up every day and tell God what hurt me. Because if I can admit that something hurt me, it means that I am vulnerable. And that vulnerability invites God's strength into my life. I get up and I say, God, that conversation, that bothered me. I don't know why, but it just, it ticked me right off. The thing that that person said, the thing that that person did, how I wanted it to play out didn't happen. It just kind of hurts. And what God is always faithful to do because my vulnerability invites his strength is he will come and either change my understanding of the situation or he'll just remove my pain because our God is a healer. I walk away different every time when I am vulnerable before, before the Lord. I come to his feet and I say, Jesus, what do I do about this? I'm about to show you something that is going to blow your mind. Are you ready? This is one of the hardest things that you and I will ever have to do. Are you ready? No, you're not. Are you ready? Sometimes the hardest thing we have to do is raise our hand and ask for help. For some of us, that seems impossible. There's such a weight when you try to ask for help because you have this pride of life that's keeping you empty. You feel like you have to be in control and you have to be strong and you have to be in charge and you have to decide. But we invite God's strength when we are vulnerable and we raise our hand and say, Jesus, What do I do? Every day I look at my journal and there's a page in my journal that has a bunch of statements. And it says, I'm not wise. I'm not in control. I'm not positioning. I'm not choosing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not strong. I'm not powerful. I'm not figuring it all out and deciding. And at the very bottom of the page, it just simply says two words. He is. He is. Every day I have to admit my weakness so that I am vulnerable, vulnerable before the Lord to invite his strength. And then I have to acknowledge, I don't have this. I can't, you can. I can't, you can. What that helps me to do is it rec helps me to recognize him as Lord it's about his kingdom. It's about his purpose. It's about his strength, not mine. 
Look at Psalm 25, 8 through 9. This is what it says. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble, those willing to raise their hand and ask for help. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. The greatest statement that you and I can ever make is simply, Jesus, I need you. Not my will, but your will be done. Can you imagine being so full of his plan and his purpose and his strength that when the opportunity comes for you to build your kingdom, no room, too full, can't do it. To be so full of humility and God's strength and not mine and his plan and not mine and his kingdom and not mine, that you can't even be torn away by the scheme and the bait that has the hook. Why? Because full fish. I've been waiting for this. What are you groaning for? What is that? That's true. I did say I don't know how to fish. And what's interesting is I asked him to put the hook back on. No, I'm kidding. I, I did, definitely didn't do that. There's something that Pastor Q has been teaching us over the last few months. And what I wanna encourage you as we kind of close this series about tackling temptation is that the fight is won in the morning, not in the moment. If you wait to go to God, by the time this thing is dangling in front of your face, it's too late. You got a chance, but the fight's won in the morning, not just in the moment. And so there are a couple of things that I want you to get up and do every day so that when he tries to dangle, here, fishy, 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 fishy. That's actually exactly how I would do it too. I would probably talk to the fish because I don't know what I'm doing. You're probably not supposed to do that, are you? Because I just scared him away. I don't know. I'll tell you one thing though, the enemy is a much better fisher than I am. He will dangle what you think will fill you. so that you will bite down on the bait that looks good and experience the hook that is death. And then to become ripped away out of the life that God has called you to. Ripped out of who he says you are, what he's called you to do. Rip you away from knowing the truth of who he is and what he says about you and I. So I want us to do something together As a church, every day, let's make a commitment to do these three things. To be full of integrity, let's get up every morning and acknowledge that Jesus is our source, amen? Just to get up and say, Jesus, there are a lot of things that are gonna try to make me feel like I need them, but the only thing I need is you. Declare it in the morning. Fight as one in the morning, not in the moment. And then ask him to satisfy you. Ask him to satisfy you with the one life because the one life that God has created you for is not gonna be easy, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be amazing and it's gonna be blessed and you're going to be a tool for him to use in his hand to shape and mold and move his kingdom forward. That's why we're here, to be full of the one life that God has for you so that the bait doesn't entice you. Get up and acknowledge that Jesus is your source Ask him to satisfy you. Then for gratitude, to be full of gratitude, choose one area of struggle and thank God for what he's already given you. If you're frustrated with your kids, find something to be thankful for and thank God like crazy. Because what you see may not be be enough. The seven loaves, the five loaves and two fishes might not be enough, but it is what you have. Thank him for what you do have. Watch it become enough. Where is that area of struggle? Where is that thing that the enemy would try to tempt you to have with the lust of the eyes? Get up every day, find that area of struggle and throw gratitude in the enemy's face. I'm sorry, not interested in this. Too full, too full. For humility, to be full of humility, ask God to show you where you're weak. That's an easy conversation for him. Hard one for us to hear, but he knows. And if you're honest, so do you. We all know there are spots where we're weak. 
Ask God to show you where you're weak and then ask him to give you strength because your vulnerability will invite his strength. We were designed to be so full of godly character that we aren't interested in those other things. Full fish bite less. What if we were so full of the one life, so full of what he's already given us, so full of his strength and his plan that we're just not taking the bait? I want to end this series with the same verse that we started with in 1 Corinthians. Take a look at this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, amen? He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. I wanna finish the series where we started. He will not tempt you beyond what you can bear. Matthew Henry has a great commentary on the Bible. And what he says about this is either our trials will be proportioned to our strength or strength will be supplied in proportion to our temptations. That's our God. He will either change the temptation and the trial to fit your strength or he will change your strength to fit the trial because he doesn't want you to lose. He gave you a way to win. God designed us to be able to conquer temptation. So I don't know what temptations you deal with. Some of us have probably been dealing with temptation for many, many years. Maybe it's the same one. I don't care how ugly it is, how big it is, how long the temptation has been there, how much damage the hook has caused to your life. I want to encourage all of us today, do not be afraid because our God is a God of miracles and he designed it this way, that he will either change your situation or he will change you, but you will have enough to tackle temptation because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? We can tackle temptation with God's help. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your mercy, the truth of your word, the power that we find to live life. We thank you that your word is your voice to us today. We thank you for speaking this morning. I pray God that by the power of the Holy Spirit that this word will have hit these hearts and these lives for everybody watching online, everybody in the room today in such a way that causes them to move forward in victory over temptation. I thank you God for your mercy, your grace, for how you designed us to live full of integrity and gratitude and humility. God, we love you so much. We're so thankful to be called your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together, guys. I love you so much. Have a great day. The prayer team is up here to pray with you. We'll see you next weekend. Thank you for joining us for service today. We love that we get to serve you and your family. If you would like to continue your worship experience through giving, we have three simple, quick, and secure ways for you to do so. First, you can use text to give Simply compose a text message with the keyword thechapel.cc, followed by your gift amount to 77977. Hit send and follow the prompts. Or visit our website, thechapel.cc slash give, and complete your giving online. Finally, you can always mail in your giving to the chapel at 1324 Seven Springs Boulevard, suite number 363, Newport Ritchie, Florida, 34655. Thank you for your continued generosity. We could not and would not want to do this without you.